Okay, we are recording. We are going to do our slideshow from the beginning. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, all right, fantastic. Okay, um, we are MTSU Online. There's our logo, it's pretty. Um, okay, today we are going to talk a little bit about getting you ready for spring 2023. These are just some D2L updates and helpful tips from your instructional designers in MTSU Online. So some of the topics that we are going to cover today are preferred name and pronoun. And I really am just going to start going through these. There's not a whole lot of, of extra stuff to go with this. I'm really just going to start off by showing you all some of this stuff and how you do it and, and where you can get to it. So the first one that we're going to briefly touch on is preferred name and pronouns. Um, as you may or may not know, both of those are now available in D2L um, and through uh, our systems at MTSU. So if you have students or if you yourself want to make sure that those are available within D2L, uh, that's a pretty simple fix. The preferred name over there on the right side of your D2L homepage, you should have that little announcement from Albert Wittenberg that says, hey, with this update that we did in December, uh, it may have erased some of the manual stuff, so please make sure your students fill this out. Uh, make sure that they know that link exists and fill that out. Uh, we actually have some instructions on some of these things, so if y'all would like copies of those, we can send them to you. Um, but for pronouns within D2L, uh, I'm going to show you what that looks like. So um, here is a class list for one of my um, sandboxes. Uh, and you can see that Tara has hers. You can see that MTSU Online um, doesn't have them. Uh, we are telling you this. We're kind of showing you this because you can put in anything you want. So if students put something in that is not great, you may want to address that with them. Um, but the way that you change your pronouns, and I'm going to show you this, but because of my status in D2L, it shows up just a little bit differently. Uh, but to change your pronouns or set your pronouns or to uh, help your students do that, uh, you go up to the top right where your name is and you go down to account settings. And then on this page, uh, right here where it says pronouns, uh, you want to allow and then for you, it will actually let you set your pronouns. Um, for me, because of my weird status in D2L, I, I'm not a person in D2L, so I can't have pronouns. Um, so <laughs> it's exciting. Um, uh, so mine have been manually set. So if you see me in a class, it's, it shows them. Um, but for you, you would be able to right there, go in and set your pronouns. So it says that the organization, even for you, says that you don't have pronouns on record. That is because it is associated with banner and the banner pronouns option is not turned on. This is something you have to manually set in D2L. Uh, I can tell you that I've had a few students comment on that it really meant a lot to them that they saw mine and that they were uh, able to set their own, that that really shows some comfort. And it's it's a quick way for us to recognize our students and their needs. So we do encourage if you feel comfortable doing it, going in and setting your pronouns um, and just making sure that they set their preferred name, uh, because if any of you use the um, in your like welcomes and stuff, you know, those squiggly brackets that we put in there that say squiggly bracket first name. Uh, and then when somebody logs in, their first name is in there. If it is officially changed to their preferred name in Banner, that is recognized in D2L when you use the squiggly bracket first name. Um, so that's just something to kind of be aware of because those are some of those AI things that we use to make a class a little bit more personal. Um, okay, and then back to my presentation, which is... I can't find my mouse. Where'd it go? Okay, there it is. Um, okay. Midterm calculation in the grade book. This is one that we actually do every semester. So some of you uh, may already know how to do this. Uh, if you do, um, you know, pick a topic to contemplate for a second. Um, for the rest of you, if you would like to minimize us down in the 
bottom of your screen and open your own D2L. We're actually going to walk you through how to set up your midterm grade calculation. I realize that we're four days into the semester and midterm seems like it's a thousand years away, but it's not. It'll be here in like one minute. So, but this is one way to just make it easier for you. One less thing you got to try to figure out later. Uh, so if you go under assessments and go to grades, um, go to manage grades. I need to make this bigger, don't I? It's too small. Sorry. I always forget. Um, go to manage grades. And then we're going to add a new item. And it is calculated. A lot of us don't even know what all those other ones on there are because we just use numeric every time. But calculated is down near the bottom. And then we're just going to give it a name. It is um, midterm. You are welcome to add a description if you want. Um, that is up to you. Most people see midterm and they know what that means. Um, so you're usually pretty good with that. Then as you scroll down the page, what you're going to do is go through your grade book and select the activities that you want to have calculated in your midterm. So I'm going to choose my introductory post, my syllabus quiz, um, assignment one, and discussion. Um, and then I am going to save and close. And then I'm going to go look and make sure I did that right by clicking on my inner grades. And it is now uh, way over. There's a bunch of random stuff in my class, isn't there? And here we are. We're way over here in our midterm. And um, our student has a 37.5. <laughs> and I didn't have to do any math to do that. Nothing wrong with math. I like math. Math is good, but I didn't have to think about it. And I only have one student in this class, but some of you have 150, 200, 250 students, and it's a lot. So if you can go in at the beginning of the semester and auto set your midterm and then not have to worry about it for the rest of the semester, that's one less thing on your to-do list uh, when we start rolling into mid-semester and things are getting a little busy and hectic for you. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about how to do midterm before I move on? I know I sometimes go a little fast on things that I do a lot, so. So does that mean that the grade is always updating? So if, if you had four items in there, and mm -hmm. they've turned in only one, then, and they got 100% on it, their grade would say 25%. Yes. Okay. Yes. And auto does it based on the number that you have in there. Um, okay. And if it yeah. is, if it is weighted in their statistics, it, it, it understands that. Okay. Um, have you found a way that like are students bothered by that? Are they freaking out uh, during the um, that it's in there. So one of the things that you can do if you don't want them to see it um, until you're ready for them to see it, you can actually go in and edit and put a release condition on it um, and put restrictions. So you can actually set it so that it's hidden. Um, so you can just hide from users until the day that you're ready to do it. Um, or you can set it so that it has an availability start and end date. So you can actually set it so they only see it like the week of midterms and then it's gone. Um, yeah. Or you can hide it until the day that you want to release it to them. Uh, in, my, in my classes, I tell my students early on that I use the grading system of um, that everything that isn't submitted counts as a zero. Uh, within the grade. So any grades that they see that are calculated grades, they know are not 100% accurate. But I have, I have learned from my own experience, and this may be different for other people, that that works out better than the one where it says drop everything that's not graded, because that sometimes gives students an inflated 100%. Uh, and then they don't always participate to the level they probably should. Because they're like, well, I still have an A in the class, right? But you have done one thing out of 20. So you really only have a five. Um, so that's, I just am very upfront about that with them. And then I tell them when the midterm is going to show up. Uh, for me, it's just a lot of open communication about what that's going to look like for them. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions about midterm before we go to our next topic? 
Okay. Okay, our next topic is audio video feedback. Yay! So the reason that we wanted to add this one in here um, is actually because there's been a little bit of an update in D2L in terms of how that feedback is done. Um, so when we go in under, and there's like a million different ways that you can get here, but when we go in under our um, student to see their activity and uh, what they have available, <laughs> that's funny that that's my I always love it when I find things like that. Um, so when we go in and we look and we see that the student has submitted some information, um, which apparently for me was some sort of funny little meme that I put in there. Um, shenanigans, because life is more fun when you're up to something. Um, so you've been able to do audio video feedback before uh, within Dropboxes and things it's changed a little bit. And what's changed about it a little bit is that um, video note forever and ever and ever was just video. So this can be used for feedback or it can be used within your classes for announcements or anywhere that you have normally put video notes in in the back um, or in, in the past. Um, when you click on audio, it now actually shows up as a video it's the same way that video note was. So it's record audio and you do a new recording and it's audio only. So anywhere that you can go in and do a video note. So any description box anywhere on D2L, anywhere in feedback, um, anywhere that you've ever been able to do a video note, you can now do it as an audio note too. So some of the, the upsides of that, um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not always video ready. Uh, maybe y'all are, but some days people don't need to see all this. Um, so on those days, but I'm busy grading, it's really great if I can do an audio feedback. Um, it also is super helpful if you are someone who um, is encouraging your students to do podcasts as an assessment. They're not going to have to go out and find a different type of um technology to use they can literally just use video note and do it as an audio pod podcast uh, within d2l which keeps it contained and then you know that, that students will be able to view it because uh, sometimes we run into that problem that they're like let me do this on my iphone and they record something as a, a movie and then anyone who doesn't have an apple device can't see it um, so anything that we record within d2l using video node or any of our other uh, services within it, other students will be able to see it without downloading additional devices. Uh, so to do an audio is just like a video note one that you literally just hit the new recording. It starts to record. You hit literally just hit the new recording. So there you go. it starts to record. Uh, and then when you're done, you have an audio file that you can add into your class as an announcement, as something in a description box, as audio feedback. Um, it pops up the same way when you hit add that you um, give it its title, a description if you want to. You can set your captioning and then you add it and all of a sudden you have a there it is. Um, it is now an audio attachment for your student as your feedback. So for some of us, that's also super, super good and different too, because sometimes we get tired of typing the same things over, but you could really actually give your student some very personal uh, directed feedback through audio and video um, and, and really address some specific things. And then they can also hear tone um, if you use video, they can actually see some facial expressions. Um, it's really kind of just gives a different way for you to be able to communicate with your students through feedback or to give them that information at other points during the, uh, the class and the semester. So we're big proponents of video note and audio notes um, because it can really add to meeting students where they are, meeting everybody's different learning needs, um, how they process feedback and assessments and things like that. And it really does open up a whole new door uh, in terms of because more and more 
groups are using uh, or organizations and classes and stuff are using podcasts as a possible assessment tool. So the fact that students can now do that as a audio only is also really good for that because it opens that up. Uh, does anybody have any questions about audio or video notes? I see it going, but I figure y'all will tell me if I need to do something. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say this. This is really very interesting and very helpful, but I wanted to know if I can use the audio in the delivery of the content. You know, I'm, I'm not very good at creating the videos. <laughs> no, that's okay. So it's this. It's the same. You know, um, like we record a lecture. Can I use that option? Um, so video notes not great for lecture necessarily because you don't have a way to, to screen share in video note. Um, and though it has up to a 30 minute time, um, you cannot edit the captions in video note. Um, or audio note. So if you are looking to do something that is a an actual lecture and not just like a quick update or, hey, I'm just checking in or did you see this article or let's chat about this because you cannot change the captions. Uh, if you have someone that needs an accommodation in your course, you would have to go in um, and create a transcript and then edit that transcript and upload that transcript. So it really kind of depends on what you're using it for. If it's a quick one or two minute uh, video or audio, creating a transcript isn't going to take very long. If it's a 30 minute lecture, creating a transcript from that and editing it uh, could could take you 11 gazillion lifetimes, mm -hmm. um, depending on how well the captions do. Um, so if you're thinking lecture, it probably makes it's probably better to use uh, like a YouTube auto captioning um, or something like that because they usually get a little closer because it's it's global uh, and D2L's auto captioning is based on its how much it's gotten in. And while D2L is a, a very big company and a big program, it is not YouTube um, in terms of the number of people and the amount of AI. Okay. Uh, but if you do want to add like a quick uh, audio or video announcement or something anywhere in anything that has a description box. So anywhere that says um, add description um, or in a news item where you get this pop up box that has the paragraph and all these things so that you can edit your content anywhere that you have the insert stuff button, which is this one that's the play pause record and stop. Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere that exists, when you click on that, you come down and add video note is one of those options. When you click add video note, uh, that is where it gives you the option at the bottom for it to be right now it says record webcam. If I turn audio only on like that, then it my uh, audio will come only. It will not record me. If I turn audio off, it will actually let me record my video it's mad at me right now because i'm using my camera <laughs> um, so i can't it's not going to record my face right now because my camera's in use so um so that's kind of how that works um but anywhere that you see one of these boxes that this exists you can put an audio note or a video note into it okay all right so the next one is not actually one that we're doing per se. Um, this isn't something that we, I can show you some ways to do it and I may click in and show you some ways to look, but this is just a reminder that your attendance is due next week. Um, and you don't want to be that person that gets the, the email that you didn't submit it. So as a reminder, <laughs> because of reporting purposes um, for Clearinghouse and for making sure that financial aid and the Department of Education stay happy with us, um, don't forget to do your attendance reporting next week. And it's a little bit different in online than it is face to face because um, how we show up is different. When someone comes to class, check, you're here. Um, in online learning, they have to have participated in some way. So that could be um, an email or communication with you directly, uh, or it can be 
an active participation in something in the class. They have submitted something, they have participated in a discussion, they have done something to show that they are in the class. Simply logging in is not enough. Um, so you need to show that they have participated. That That is why sometimes we have things like um, a syllabus quiz or we have some, our, um, our the one that we encourage is that um, True Blue Pledge and Academic Integrity Survey that's in there. Uh, an introduction discussion is a great way to do that. Um, anything like that, that's something that within that first week they can already submit. It doesn't need to be a high point value activity, um, but they need to be able to see that they've done something in the class other than just log in. And uh, part of why uh, you want it to be more than just logging in is when you go and look at, at progress through the class list, um, you got to make sure that you notice the difference between uh, class activity and login because one is for logging into D2L, the other is for the actual class. So it's much better to look at progress um, in the actual class through activities. So not a lot to that one. We just wanted to give you your reminder that that's coming up um, so you don't forget. Okay, this is a big one. I, I'm just making an assumption about us in general that we all know who Nancy Reagan is. Um, just say no. This mm -hmm. is one that we run into a lot more than, than we like to acknowledge. So this is our way of officially telling you to just say no to non-licensed third-party systems. And what that means is if it is not one that is approved for use, through MTSU and you require your students to log in, take an, create an account, submit academic activities and things like that, you are actually opening yourself up to um, things that you may not want to deal with later. Um, so some primary ones to consider on this are ones that we see the most often that have the greatest potential of causing you some issues um, are things like Flipgrid, um, Kahoot, uh, Slack, any of the socials like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those, um, I know, TikTok or Twitter talk or, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, all of those things. Um, and then other things that you ask students to go in and create an account and participate in some way, you are if it hasn't been approved through the university, it has not gone through the FERPA requirements and you're requiring students to share information that could actually violate FERPA. Um, it could be opening them up to security situations that you do not want to take ownership of that. Um, if it's through our single sign-on, they have gone through that process and we know that they're okay. Um, you also could, um, run into um, some other issues with that as well, um, in addition to FERPA and um, security issues. So just be aware not to use third party. If you need some help finding some activities that are uh, comparable, but are not going to require students to create an account someplace else or to log into something that isn't approved through our uh, single sign-on, then we are happy to help you. Um, a lot of the things that people say, I want Flipgrid or I want Kahoot because I want to be able to do this activity and this activity is cool. Well, um, MTSU, all faculty have an H5P account and H5P can do almost all of those things and then a whole lot more. Um, if you're looking for something like an engaging activity, um, H5P can do a word cloud. They can do an emoji cloud. How cool is that? We could have emojis popping up. Um, crosswords, memory games, uh, flashcards that you create, image hotspots, and that's just a few. Uh, there are a ton out there that you could use that create a lot of engagement and interacting for your students and would replace the things that are like Flipgrid and Kahoot and Slack and things like that, um, that are actually protected through our single sign-on. So um, Tara actually has a presentation on H5P coming up in a couple weeks. So kind of keep an eye out for that. I think we're gonna be talking about crosswords 
and clouds and QR codes, I think maybe, uh, and maybe something else. I don't remember for sure. Um, but there are also a whole bunch of those H5P recordings on our MTSU online YouTube channel. If you want to go check some of those out and learn a little bit more about it. Um, and then there's other programs and things that are out there that are approved. So this is our way of reminding you, don't do it because you think it's easier. Make sure that you're using something that the university is aware of. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us or to ITD and they can help you see where um, different technologies are approved for use uh, for students on campus. So we're not trying to scare you really. We just wanted to show you a little bit of some RuPaul and some Nancy um, so that you can kind of start your day uh, with something fun. So do y'all have any questions about third-party non-licensed? I guess I'm not, sorry, can you hear You're, me? No, ask all the questions you want. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand what this is. Um, is this uh, times where, for example, I'll find uh, a video, an interesting video on schizophrenia on YouTube, and I, I kind of uh, copied and pasted it in my uh, D2 ad, is that the... Someone no, wrote. that's fine because you're adding the resource in. If you um, are requiring students to create uh, a username and password to oh. an external uh, okay. technology, that's where you run into copying uh, or, or loading in a, a video or something in D2L, that's not the same. So I get one way to think about it. Um, MTSU has um, all students and faculty and staff have access to LinkedIn Learning through our single sign-on and it can be integrated into D2L. Um, so if you use the single sign-on as the way that you embed that content into D2L or that you share it with your students and it's protected. If you tell your students to go out and create um, a secondary LinkedIn account using a non-MTSU email address and create a username and password that way, you're actually opening yourself up to some issues. So if you want them to use LinkedIn stuff, just have them log in through their single sign-on and then it's it's gone through that protection. Um, the MTSU legal department looks at these things. Um, we also send it through um, the accessibility checks with um, the compliance office. Um, things like Flip, Flipgrid and Kahoot are not actually accessible uh, in most cases. So if you have a student that has that needs an accommodation of some sort, you you are going to have to go in and figure out how to fix the code in Kahoot or Flipgrid or something like that. H5P already has that built into the back end. So it's generally accessible to begin with. Um, and you don't have to learn code. So, I mean, maybe you know a bunch of HTML code. I don't. So I just go with the one that already has it done for me. Um, so that's really what we're talking about. And we usually see a lot of this at the beginning of a semester um, because we were like, oh, I saw this thing and I want to add it. Sure, but let's see if we can figure out a way to do it that we make sure that you're not creating some issues for your students or yourself down the road. So Kim, is this primarily about things like, um, I have a colleague who shall remain nameless who had students meet on Discord. Yeah. That's the kind of thing you don't want to be doing. Yeah. By yeah, contrast, if you say to a student, this is a course in which we're going to talk about, say, video games uh, uh, as part of the class, you can say to them, you can make a Discord account so that you can be involved in some chat with some group about a video game or watch something or Twitch or whatever, but we're not going to meet there and do any classwork together there. But you right. can go there, make an account, and gather data or something like that. So yeah. it's more that you should not have class involvement on these other sites. So another example I was thinking of is I tell students you can make a free student account at Canva where you'll have more options for your PowerPoint or for making a graphic or something mm -hmm. like that for the class. And that's fine, too, because it's one of number of options, and it's not about interacting and possibly conducting class in a space yes. that's not FERPA approved. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's really where the big difference is, is the requiring them to create an account in, in a space that you will then use to assess them. Um, because that's, yeah, 
that's where the big issue is. Because if you're telling them that, you know, Canva has a student account and they can create that, but then there's also PictaChart and Vengage and like eight other ones that they can choose from, they're making that choice um, as to which one they create an account in. If they decide to create an account or just use it as guest, they're making that choice. If you are requiring them to, um, to do it, for to an activity. share their material on Canva, and I'm yeah. going to go on to Canva and assess to, it. That's where you're see their gonna... work and grade it. Okay, mm -hmm. I think I get it. Yeah. Thank you. That's where the big difference is. I know it's sort of a gray area, and it's sort of strange and a little odd, but it's one that we just want to make sure that y'all have the information. Um, and if you find something that you want to to do, reach out to any of us. Reach out to anybody over in the um, CTT. And they um, they can also help with finding the right technologies for you. So that's that's what we're all here for um, is to help support y'all in some of that stuff. So don't feel like you're all alone. We got gotcha. you. All right. Um, so some hot topics that uh, have been coming up and going around here as of late. So the first one is the new quiz tool. Um, there. In D2L, there's a new quiz tool. Um, depending on what your system is and whether or not you've set it, um, when you go in the first time to create a tool, it may ask you if you want to keep the old. Um, and you can keep the old if you would like to, uh, or you can go ahead and switch to the new. So the biggest thing that to know about the new, uh, because this is the new one, the one that you're looking at now is the new one. The biggest thing to note about this, everything is almost exactly the same as the old one. Um, those of you that are new are like, what was the old one? Um, but everything is basically exactly the same in terms of what it's called as the old one, but the layout now matches your Dropbox assignment folders. So things are, they're converting so that each tool uh, and assessment tool are looking the same. So you're not having to keep going in and be like, all right, where's this on quizzes? Where do I find restrictions? Where do I find um, different, all those different things that are in the different tabs? Those things are now over here on the, the right-hand side, similar to the way they are in assignment folders. Everything else is basically the same. Um, it's that your hidden is down here at the bottom instead of being on the restrictions page. Your assessment is on the right instead of being on the assessments tab. Uh, so it's really just giving you that chance to start thinking about it in terms of the perspective to match the other assessment tools. This is where you tie it to your gradebook instead of having to go to the assessment tab. Uh, you can change your dates right here instead of having to go to the um, restrictions tab. It's that instead of it having a million tabs for every tiny little thing, most of the things that you use the most often are right here on the main landing page. It still has the same information of you can upload a file, you can browse your question library, uh, or you can create a new question, a section, or a pool. So some of these have also taken off one of the additional steps that when you wanted to do a pool or section that it kept bouncing you out to more and more pages. When you do them now, everything stays much more centrally located and you're just not having to bounce around to find things as much. That's the big difference is that things are now very much located on this page. It will work the same for those of you that are big quiz tool users. It works the same. It's just that things are in a slightly different spot. Uh, and you'll just kind of need to get used to where they are. But if you have been using the assignment folder tool, uh, then you already know where the conditions are, where the rubric is, um, you know, things like that. You already know where those are because you've been using it. It's just adjusting a little bit to the new quiz tool. So um, if you haven't used quiz tool to add a new question, you simply add the new question and then you select the type that you want to use um, and then it will pop up and you add your question in. It's a little slow today. Uh, and then you add your question in right here on the old one. It was it took you to a new page and then it bounced you back and you had to go back and forth and back and forth to see how things were looking um, on this one. 
when you type it in. All right, meh, I feel like meh is a good one. Um, we're gonna randomize it. Don't forget to randomize because uh, that's like the fastest way to prevent people from sitting next to each other and having the same test show up. Um, as always, your options up in the top, this is where you can add feedback. You can add a hint, descriptions, add weights. Um, all that is still available. When you hit save now, and it comes back, instead of you being on another page, it's all right here on this same page. So it's a pop-up box that you look at your new question, and then once you save it, it's right here. You're not having to go back and forth. Um, that's really what it's done is it's taken out a couple steps and made it so it's much more streamlined for you on that front page. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the new quiz layout? You're like, no, not yet. My quizzes are already set. Talk to me before next semester. We'll talk about it again in August. Don't worry. <laughs> and just to reiterate, this is something that might pop up when you first hit the quizzes as an option to turn this on or turn this off. Yes. Thank yes. Uh, at least for a little while. Uh, at some point, D2L says you no longer have an option. Here's the new one. Um, but for a little while, you actually have the option to keep it under the old format um, and continue using that. Um, if it's something that you want to play around with for a little bit before you really need to be building a bunch of quiz, turning it on and starting to play in it is probably a really good idea. But um, yeah, yeah, it's still an option. So when you get that pop-up box and it asks you which version you want, you can tell it that you want to keep the old one. That's fine. I think a couple of the instructional designers still have the old one turned on and by a couple, I mean the other two. Um, <laughs> um, I turned it on so that I could actually show y'all the new tool. Um, so that's the, uh, we haven't had to use it yet much either. So, all right. So actually, I'm going to, I'll say real quickly, I did have to use it recently in a class and it takes a little bit of adjustment mm -hmm. to get used to just because it looks different. And I wanted to turn on the old version, but I made myself leave on the new version <laughs> so I could get used to it. Um, but it, it is a little bit of an adjustment because the questions look so different because they're they're abbreviated since they have that stuff on the other side, those widgets on the other side. So it looks a little compressed. But once you get used to it, just like anything else, you get used to it. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, the last one. So... I would suspect that uh, many of you have heard about this awesome new opportunity for students and AI. Um, so chat GBT is an AI driven program that allows for ac activities and assessments to be created through AI. Um, that sounds awesome, doesn't it? Um, that's going to make things really fun for mm -hmm. us as uh, faculty and institutional administrators. Um, AI. What's AI? Uh, artificial intelligence. So you can literally type in a question and it can produce the answer for you because it has AI and in art, um, artificial intelligence from all of the interweb or the internet's or the World Wide Web, or whatever you want to call it. Um, all of that is out there. Um, so it will pick up on some of those things and help produce the activity. Uh, there are some things in, that are already in place to help with that. Um, there's uh, a couple of people have created um, additional apps that can help faculty combat it and kind of tell right away whether or not it's something. Um, turn it in. If you have turn it in enabled on your assignment folders, then uh, turn it in will recognize uh, because of the percentage that it it can it can show you those percentages and if things are are in there accurately and correctly. Um, so there are a couple of things that are already coming out and in place to try to combat it a little bit. Um, 
I guess um, my words of advice, take these as far as you feel comfortable doing, because uh, they're literally just Kim's words. Um, try not to panic. It's going to be okay. We'll figure it out. Um, and think a little about your activities and assessments and how you might be able to combat it a little bit. Um, and I say that in that if you're using um, a publisher's test bank, um, this is not going to make a big difference because all that stuff is already out there on Chegg and everything else that you could think of that it's on. Uh, and that happens about one minute after the first time that test bank gets produced. Um, so kind of think about ways that you might want to update your questions or alter your information so that you're not making it as readily available. Um, same with if you are looking at um, assignments or activities that are specific to the assignment folder that are more like an essay or um, a longer paper. I would encourage um, helping you to put something that's a little more authentic in your question. Um, so if you add statements about personal experiences or tell me where you've seen this or reflect on where you see this in your life or um, how does this make you feel? Um, everybody in your class isn't going to have the exact same emotion or the exact same experience or the exact same way to make that connection. So if multiple people are having the same experience, then you're running into an issue and you should definitely consider whether or not they use some sort of AI device. Um, like I can, I can promise you right now that if you asked the three instructional designers about any kind of experience that got us to where we are today, you're not going to get the same answer from us. Uh, we, we have been through very different things to get here. So if you ask us something and encourage us to add our own personal interpretations, our own personal experiences, how we critically think about something and apply the information, you're going to get different answers. So that's what that's what we're saying, like, as we're, we're just putting our toes in this situation. Um, so we can't give you a whole lot of information about it yet, though we are working on an article for our upcoming newsletter. So be on the lookout for that. It is coming. Um, but we just wanted to address it kind of ahead of time to just be like, make sure that if you're worried, turn on your turn it in where you can. And um, and to really kind of consciously think about making your activities and assessments a little bit more um, authentic and personal. Uh, you know, for example, I, there's one coming up at the end of the semester, and I talked about it last semester too, um, an infograph. AI is not going to create your infograph for you, um, but AI can um, write your essay. So can, can we get there through... It, does it help to do a podcast or a video or an infograph or a presentation as opposed to um, a paper or an essay? Um, and some of our classes need those papers and essays as opposed to other things. So how can we help make those papers and essays really connect to the student in a way that it's not going to have quite as much of an AI slant? And did you have a question? Can I jump in real quick before Anne asked her question? Yeah. I just want to let everyone know too within the newsletter, I'm actually working on it right now. And there's going to be a lot of resources in there about what AI is, how to combat it. And also there is an open educational resource that's been created by faculty at various institutions about how to address this potentially in their syllabus or within a statement in an online class. And that resource is going to be in the newsletter too. So I put the, the link to the newsletter. It's not quite out yet, but I, it will get out next week um, and it'll be published on our website. So y'all will be able to have access to those resources to get some idea, more ideas about how to combat work within this new technology realm. Thank you, Tara. And, and please, Anne, ask your question. <laughs> well, it was more of a comment. Um, I had noticed last fall and the last couple of discussions and then one of my one essay that there was some odd phrasing and it wasn't that it was well written in a sense, but it didn't make sense. 
in some spots and I could not find it. Turn it in, didn't find it. And I just knew, I was like, they've done something and I, I couldn't put my finger on it, but luckily they had enough fact wrong that I could mark them down, but I couldn't prove that they had cheated. So I didn't turn it in. So, and then like literally a week later, it hit about <laughs> the, the, the chat and I was like, oh my God, that is what they did. I know that's what they did. So what I've done is, is what Tara said is I put a statement in my syllabi this semester and, and included it in like this using AI in this class is considered a form of plagiarism. If you do it, you will, if I find out that you've done it, I will turn you in because it's just, but the hard thing is going to be a, is catching it in discussions because you can't link a discussion response to turn it in. So you really kind of have to have your spidey senses on and go, this doesn't sound right. So copy paste into one of the tools that that nice young man, I think he's at Columbia made that can uh, can mm -hmm. determine if it was AI generated. But it's just and I, I've talked to, you know, I've got kids that are college age. And they love all things computer, but they're they're mad. They're like, why would you do that? I mean, isn't the whole point of going to college to learn and you're not learning if you cheat, then again, they are my children. So <laughs> perhaps other There's people that. are differently <laughs> motivated. There's that. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Thanks for sharing that too. Appreciate it. Um, yes. So that's really all we wanted to talk about about that because there, it's so new and we are trying to gather some resources for you. Um, but we really did just kind of want to tell you to just there's some ways that you can combat it a little bit here just getting started and and we're here to help you as best we can um, and support you through this. So it's the newest thing um, and it's I guess it's where we are. So um, I don't know. Um, okay, that is actually our last topic. So um, I'm actually going to stop the screen share. And, um, and then if you give me a second, I will also stop the recording. Um, and then we will, um, there we go.